Thank you everyone for coming today, and I'd like to acknowledge my co-presenters. Um, amazing work. I hope I can add to that with my presentation. So, hello everyone. Um, my name is Amelia Gavin, and today I plan to present an ongoing line of research regarding why black women are at heightened risk to experience adverse birth outcomes. And if I have time, I'd like to briefly discuss a multi-year intervention study that um, I'm working on with some others designed to improve birth outcomes among blacks. So how do we define an adverse birth outcome? Well, in humans, birth normally occurs at a gestational age around 40 weeks in a range between 37 and 42 weeks. So infants born before 37 weeks of completed gestation are considered premature and are at increased risk for mortality and morbidity. I'm not an Apple person, <laughs> so I'm going to have to go back to my notes. Um, a population-based longitudinal study using registry data from 1.2 million births in Norway reported that prematurity was associated with diminished long-term survival and reproduction. In addition to the human costs associated with preterm birth, the economic costs are profound. An IOM report estimated that the annual societal economic burden associated with preterm birth, including medical care through ed early education, childhood education, maternal delivery services, and other labor market um, productivity, was at least $26 billion. So, although women who are at risk for delivering preterm can be identified clinically, the majority of cases are unknown. Our lack of knowledge regarding the etiological nature of preterm birth has led some to conclude that preterm birth is one of the most persistent and least understood public health concerns in the United States. And unfortunately, this is compounded by one factor, the persistent disparity in preterm birth between black and white women. So low birth weight, which many of you may have heard about, is another adverse birth outcome. It's linked to complications not only in the neonatal period, but also over the life course. For example, research shows that low birth weight in combination with rapid weight gain in early childhood is associated with cardiovascular events in adulthood. In addition, low birth weight has been linked to chronic health conditions in adulthood, including obesity, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension. So although you can see that recently the preterm birth rate has decreased across time, which is a good thing, right? The black-white difference in preterm birth persists. And if I showed you um, findings across different years, it would look exactly the same. So extensive efforts, as you can imagine, have been made to identify the social demographic behavioral risk and obstetric factors associated with that with or that predict preterm birth and low birth weight. Despite knowledge of the presence of these maternal risk factors, the racial differences persist. So given the persistent racial differences in low birth weight and preterm delivery, maternal risk factors that drive down rates over time have to be different than the factors that drive them apart. So the question comes of, in these discussions about genetic variation, right? So there hasn't been much support for that explanation. I think that's in large part to the work of James Collins and his colleagues at Northwestern University, who've looked at Illinois state vital statistic records and looked at birth weight distribution for US foreign and foreign born black and white women, and most recently have looked at intergenerational birth weight distributions. So I'm gonna show you the work and why I think it has a lot to do with why there isn't a genetic explanation. So what you're looking at are two graphs for the descendants of foreign-born and U.S.-born white women. And what you expect to see is a birth rate distribution that shifts up or improves over time. And that's what you see with these two graphs. Is that working? Yes. Do you want to Yes, thank you. <laughs> so the third graph you're looking at is the descendants of U.S.-born black women. The birth rate distribution, again, increases slightly to the right, but not to the greater extent as we saw with the U.S. foreign and foreign-born white women. 
like what happens when I show you US, um, sorry, African women of African descent. So these are the descendants of African women or Caribbean black women. The birth rate distribution does not shift to the right. It shifts to the left. It decreases. The authors explain their findings by stating that maternal lifelong minority status or something closely related to it is associated with infant birth weight. So from my perspective, it's always been, what in part drives my research is, what are the mechanisms by which lifelong minority status affects birth outcomes? So what about preconception health and periconception health? Beginning in the 1980s, people may have heard of the fetal origins hypothesis, Barker's hypothesis. Finding some epidemiological studies highlighted the role of the fetal environment in the course of adult health. Subsequent studies in biopsychosocial frameworks suggest that health development has a genesis prior to conception and is influenced by risk and protective factor factors across generations and the lifespan. So given this body of research, this raises the question whether the traditional prenatal period is an adequate time frame to reverse the long-term consequences of risk exposures among women at greatest risk for delivering a low birth weight or preterm infant. So I have to give credit to my mentor, John Lynch, who actually drafted this slide for me that I've been using for the past 15 years. <laughs> it's an oldie but a goodie. So in contrast to the traditional prenatal period, a life course approach not only takes into consideration the role of biological, biological and individual risk factors. Come on, where's my lady? I love this slide. Um, so it takes into consideration the biological and individual risk factors, but also the role of the social environment and structural factors. And all these matter on the health status across the life course of anyone, including black women. As a result, birth outcomes are not only the end product of the fetal environment, but reflect the, reflect the effects of cumulative burden, which can be conceptualized as chronic stressors like racial discrimination, economic disadvantage, for example. So across the life course, that places some women at increased risk for adverse birth outcomes prior to pregnancy. So many of you have heard the idea of Alistair Glode, yes? You know, someone says. Well, let me tell you. <laughs> so I'm trying to explain um, these findings. Uh, Alex.Globe, Globe, which is a composite indicator for cumulative stress and biological risk, provides a framework for which to evaluate the impact of cumulative burden. So according to the theory of Alex.Globe, Globe, exposure to acute stressors is adaptive, while exposures to chronic stressors are maladaptive. It may result in cascading, potentially irreversible changes in the biological stress regulatory system. So chronic stressors increase alcohol load over time. Across the life course, increased alcohol load results in premature aging, biological aging, which may lead to individual differences to increase vulnerability and in stress-induced diseases. A complementary framework that some folks may have heard about is weathering. So weathering is a complementary framework and especially pertains to black women. Maternal age would plays a role in birth outcomes because it reflects maternal biological preparedness for pregnancy and childbirth. According to weathering, black women's repeated exposure to socioeconomic and political marginalization and exclusion reflects cumulative burden. It also compounds with age, leading to increasing racial differences in health status which results in black women being at increased risk for adverse birth outcomes at younger ages. So you think about young adulthood being your prime time for childbearing, not necessarily for black women. So after 15 years of studying this, I finally get to say that I get to do an intervention. And it's quite ambitious. <laughs> Um, because we're trying to stem the flow of structural inequality. <laughs> and we're trying to offer up an interven interventions across the life course, early life course, that really buffer African American youth from the influence of chronic stressors across the life course. So go with me on this one. 
So given the role of weathering and its impact on black women's health, you're designing a multi-year, multi-level preventive intervention designed to be a social buffer for the stress response system by reducing behavioral risk factors in kids and improving um, protective factors in the wake of everyday stresses like micro and macro aggressions. Okay. Um, so we're doing this, our sample in particular are uh, black females and black males starting in third grade. Over the long term, we expect reduced physiological degradation or weathering to result in better birth outcomes in the next generation and reduce the thus reducing the intergenerational transmission of health disparities. So we're using some evidence-based um, interventions, which some people have argued with me and I agree with them, that they may have be different among different um, racial groups. But we're going with the best ones we have, which are at the classroom level, at the school level, at the family level, and at uh, the entire procedural around disciplinary issues in schools, which is very important to black youth. So I will be able to stop there. Oh, that's okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks, Eddie. Um, so just a little bit more about the interventions. Um, Raising healthy children is an evidence-based evidence intervention that's around classroom level management and how the teacher handles um, issues in the classroom. And then there's positive family support, which is a multi-level family-centric intervention which is designed to address family functioning, particularly around middle school, when adolescent risk behaviors increase. And we know that adolescent risk behaviors are causal in, t in um, terms of adverse birth outcomes or subsequent prenatal substance use. We're also letting teachers decide what they want to do with having a physical activity um, for teachers to generate more physical activity among kids, thus lowering their, um, um, their health risk. And then the one I'm really excited about is this kind of multi-tiered school-wide intervention to disciplinary problems that are racially just. So if anyone knows anything about disciplinary policies in schools and how it disadvantages African-American youth, you know this is an important component to keeping kids in school keeping them on track, and improving their health outcomes over the long term. And you don't want to see my draft logic model. <laughs> <laughs> I don't